Hello, my name's Dan. I'm the Product Marketing Manager here at Slug Disco. And in today's video, we're going to be sitting down with Tom, the solo developer of Ecosystem. I'm going to be talking to him about how early access has gone for the game so far and kind of the inspiration behind the game in the first place. And then I'll be handing over to Tom, who will do a deep dive, no pun intended, into the latest major update to hit the game in early access, which is the Evolution Sandbox update. So without further ado, let's just jump straight into the video. So do you want to give us a brief history of Ecosystem? Uh, Kind of where the idea came from uh, and how it evolved to the point it is at now sure um so the the original idea for ecosystem was was kind of inspired by some research that was done back in the 90s um, by a guy named carl sims at uh, mit and um and so basically what he was doing was this was the 90s so he was working on a on a supercomputer at the time um so he had this idea of of um, essentially using a kind of virtual genetic code to specify creatures that were made out of boxes um, and running them through an evolutionary algorithm and getting them to the point where they could do things. Um, and so uh, I, I sort of thought he, he made a great video of it uh, at one point that was around uh, that went around SIGGRAPH and some of the other like graphics related uh, um, research groups. Uh, and so so basically the the idea of ecosystem, uh, the, the core concept of it, it's based on that research and it's that you sort of so you, you take these creatures that are, are um, physically specified so there are a bunch of limbs stuck together in different ways and each creature also has a has its own neural system uh, its own brain basically and those those that neural system is essentially a pipeline computer so like you have input coming in at the you know the eyes or the skin for touch or things like that, uh, contact sensors and joint position sensors and things like that. They sort of feed it up to neurons that do different kind of functions, and ultimately they output uh, to uh, muscles, uh, and those muscles contract joints. So the the creatures in the ecosystem move the same way that we do. Like they don't play an animation the way that like most games would sort of handle. Like the average game just has a, a animation that a, a, an animator made, you know, even if there's some inverse kinematics or something in it. Um, the the creatures in the ecosystem are actually moving like a like a human. Um, they if if they need to you know do a swimming motion, they actually have to contract all of their joints in the right way to to actually do that. So the idea is that you kind of start with a bunch of creatures that have random bodies and random brains, just bodies that are stuck together, limbs going everywhere, and brains that are just firing. So most of them are just kind of flailing around wildly, basically. Um, but some of them will flail in such a way that they move a little bit. Um, they, they, you know, manage to get a few feet forward in, the, in, their, in their brief lifespan. Um, and so if you take those and, and let them have kids, and then you run the same procedure again on their kids, you mutate, you have a little bit of random mutation on their genes. Um, then eventually after, you know, 20 generations, you actually have something that can kind of swim a little bit that actually has evolved to be able to move, um, directly. And, and the way that the creatures swim is also like, uh, physically simulated. So like when they, when, when you move a limb through the water, there's a drag force that pushes against it and sort of the balancing of the drag forces are, are how you manage to swim. And that's how the creatures swim too. And it's, it's important um, that the physics is very accurate and that, that it's very, um, that everything is sort of simulated in that way because ecosystem is very much a game where function kind of drives form, just like in, in nature, like um, the shape of a fish is driven by what is what is a good shape to be if you want to swim. I mean, and, and there's a lot of different options, you know, in nature and, and of course, our simulation isn't quite as in depth as, as actual nature, you know. Um, but it, it still is; it still exhibits some of the same kinds of benefits to it. Um, and and so uh, so things like the the physics of swimming will will sh shape the creatures' bodies, and even to to an extent, uh, smaller things like um, if if there's a lot of sort of small like if, if a creature is eating mostly just mushrooms and things that are very close to the the sea floor, they need to evolve in such a way that. Uh, that they have a long, thin body that can easily reach. They can actually get to those things and not get bumped into stuff, or or have mushrooms that are just out of reach because you're too kind of chubby to to actually get to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, and there were even some cases where, like uh, when I first uh, when I first was working on the game, I found a lot of creatures evolving to be like 
kind of propellers. Like they would, they would always do this all the time, very quickly even. Um, and and uh, it turned out essentially that that uh, the reason they were doing that is because um, most game physics engines don't conserve angular momentum. So they, they conserve energy. Um, and in, in real life, uh, our physics conserves angular momentum, but it's usually not needed for the purposes of a, of a game. And uh, the creatures were, were essentially adapting to exploit that. They could sort of spin forever. And if you put a fin in the right place, you can turn that spin into a thrust. Um, and, and so uh, that was actually something that had to be fixed. I had to kind of put on a little patch to the phys physics uh, simulation, so that the, the core physics engine, so that it would actually would conserve the angular momentum. But it, it's sort of like an interesting way of thinking about how like the, the it, it's almost like the rules of, of the, the physics engine are kind of like the rules for the universe that they live in, in a way. Yeah, and you use um, Unity to develop ecosystem, right? Yeah. Um, so ecosystem was all in Unity. Um, I'd worked in, uh, I'd, I'd worked as an engine programmer before that. So I'm I'm familiar with with sort of getting into the the dirt of things. Um, but especially for for a solo project. Um, you, you could spend, you know, an eternity writing low-level code um, if, if you're not uh, if you're not careful. Um, and so it, it actually helped a lot for me to um, to sort of not have to reinvent the wheel, which which I kind of did on on the game I made before this one. Yeah. Um, to have to do it all to do it all again. And I never actually felt too constrained in any way. Like I actually felt like for the most part, even as far as like performance goes and stuff, I actually could largely do everything that I needed to do. That's good. Um, so ecosystem, obviously, it's been out in early access for a little while now. We um, back in March, uh, it celebrated its one-year anniversary. Um, yeah, and it's seen quite a lot of different updates to the game so far, such as the aquarium mode, uh, where you can view your creatures, and the terraform update, uh, which overhauled the terrain uh, manipulation and generation uh, to allow for more customization. Uh, and what we're kind of talking about, we're going to be talking about today, is the evolution sandbox, which is the kind of uh, the biggest update really so far on a fundamental level. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about why you thought the um, why you felt that that was needed, why the evolution sandbox uh, was the kind of way that you progressed and is the next update for the game? Sure. Um, so the 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 main thing that I sort of wanted to do with the the toolbox update was kind of to give players, uh, a little bit more to do, like to add sort of more ways to interact with creatures and to customize the ecosystem. Um, so that in a sense, you really were sort of like playing with evolution. Um, you always kind of were doing that, but I, I think with the toolbox update, you have a lot more ways to do it. And it's a lot easier to do, to, to actually kind of go in and mess with things and then see how, you know, that you can kind of step in and make changes and, and try to customize things the way you want and then see how the sort of evolutionary, the algorithm that simulates evolution, um, what it sort of comes up with based on that. And then to, and, and then you can kind of further adjust things, change the environment, change the, the physical properties of the creatures and things like that. Um, so that there is kind of like a back and forth um, just to kind of make it feel a little bit more like um, like a like a game or like a, like a toy, something that you really are actively, um, or, or that at least that you can actively step in and, and uh, modify as much as you want. Yeah, because you mentioned um, kind of obviously ecosystem, it's this uh, simulation of evolution essentially isn't it so um i guess with this update you want people to be almost like they're playing with evolution like playing god essentially yeah. to all of these kind of creatures um was that important to you when developing like has this strayed much away from your original like idea for the game or is this kind of the direction you were thinking about going in anyway um, I think it's I think it's a, a natural uh, sort of a natural evolution I, I guess in the the concept of the game in a sense it's it's pretty close to sort of how I imagine it going but it definitely was inspired by player feedback I, I definitely saw like a fair amount of people who sort of wanted a little bit more to do um, you know and, and wanted more ways to, to um, and and it was also noticeable that even that that like 
a lot of the players that were sort of most into it would even sort of find ways of interacting, even sort of prior to them existing, they'd find sort of clever ways of working around things and interacting with it, which I think is also kind of a sign of like, this is something that you should look into adding, you, you know, um, this is something that people who like it really like, and it's something that people who, who um, are new to the game are kind of looking for, I think. Yeah, because we've had a lot of, um, there's a community member called Stobbs who's uh, appointed themselves as the, uh, I think they said, the lead ecosystem community scientist, and they found ways to break it and get uh, land fish, uh, or lich, yeah, as they call them, and get above was... the water level, which you would, that was never kind of intended. But while that's not officially supported, you've kind of listened to that and just allowed them to break the game in certain ways and not patched up what's essentially a bug. Um, so I yeah, think that's quite good. It has inspired those kind of uh, those people to play with the system. Yeah, I was really happy that that uh, that, that even worked. Uh, that that it, it really sort of somehow warmed my heart to to see that not only that he managed to get the camera up above and spawn the creatures, but that that on top of that, the creatures actually. Um, did start to evolve to walk to some extent. That was always kind of when I told people about the idea. People always said the end, the end game should be, uh, you know, that you've won the game when you get a, a fish that crawls up onto land. You know, like, leave. like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, and so, I, I, I never implemented it, but, um, but it made me happy that somebody figured out how to do it, anyways. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we've spoken a lot now about the evolution sandbox. Uh, I'll hand over to you and we can take a look at kind of the nitty gritty of how it actually looks and works in game. Sounds good. The toolbox is unlocked gradually as you play the game. As your ecosystem grows, you get life points that you can spend to research new plants, but now you research new creature types as well. And these creature types also unlock new parts of the toolbox and they kind of function like toolbox presets that give you examples of what the toolbox settings can do and also show how they work. So uh, for example, these coral fish are constrained to be small and colorful. They still evolve, um, but they're always kept within those parameters. So the system will kind of keep them within a constraint that keeps them small and colorful, um, but they can still evolve within those bounds. And of course, everything else about them is still open to evolve. Uh, completely freely. And this applies in the editor as well, which now has a brightness slider. So for example, if we take this creature, this is sort of a, a skin brightness that you would have seen in the past pretty frequently, a very kind of dark purple. But we can in fact move the brightness all the way up and have it turn into an almost pink color. And at this point it's actually bright enough to almost have kind of a, a coral sort of look to it. Um, and in addition to that, uh, scaling up the brightness also kind of increases the saturation. So it really feels like you have a lot more options as far as colors go than you did in the past. So after a brief time skip, we see a reef that's actually filled with very, very small creatures. Um, and with, with coloration patterns that wouldn't have been available before, very bright and sort of uh, tuned to blend in with different uh, different corals that are on the reef. The the uh, the small sort of yellow ones blend in very well with this uh, honeycomb coral, and the the blue ones with the blue acropora. One thing that I think is kind of interesting is that um, size can have a, a notable effect on. Uh, creatures' bodies. So in fact, the tiny fish, when you specify them that they have to be tiny, they actually evolve totally different or, or at least fairly different body shapes than, than what you see when you pick normal size or larger ones. Um, their bodies tend to be sort of smaller, a little more knotted, a little more like bulbous, almost a little like cute somehow. Um, and, and I think that has to do with optimizing for um, how to get the most drag when you have such a tiny body part. Um, they actually need to have uh, enough size. Uh, their muscle strength is based on the size of their body parts. And so um, they have to have a little bit more mass um, in their body parts in order to generate the thrust that they need to swim appropriately. Uh, as another example, we could try out some rays. So I'll go until we uh, unlock those. So here we have a ray creature. Um, this will unlock the dimension options. And these rays should be, uh, of course, very flat. 
uh, evolution will keep them uh, within those parameters, so um, so they should be especially adept at uh, eating things that are close to the ground. And so uh, another small time skip forward, and uh, we've got a couple of rays hunting around our coral reef. Another thing that I added for the toolbox update was actually an overall increase to the amount of symmetry in the game. And you can see this even in the random creatures that the editor produces, which are the same ones that are spawned in uh, by default when you just click the spawn button. Uh, so, so if you notice here, they almost always have like a kind of nice bilateral symmetry to them. So uh, coming back after another time skip, we see uh, the results of our customized ecosystem. And if you look around closely, you can still see tiny uh, coral reef creatures uh, that have managed to survive the whole time. For the uh, next part of the demonstration, I thought I'd switch to a different environment, this time a slightly greener and more uh, plant-heavy one. Um, I've got sort of a simple setup here with just a few species of foragers swimming around um, a sort of craggy environment with a few caves that uh, lead into an underground cave system. And what I wanted to show here actually is uh, on the one hand the fully unlocked evolutionary parameters toolbox. Um, and I also wanted to show how you can use uh, not just the presets, but also how you can sort of customize things uh, to work the way you want um, to, to make specific creatures uh, 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 that aren't sort of pre-made kind of or, or implied for you. So if, for example, I wanted to add like a, a, a giant sort of sea creature to this current environment that I have, um, I can adjust this size to make a much bigger or smaller creature. I'm going to get a little preview here. So this would be kind of a small sized one. The normal size creature is about four. Um, if I make a 20 size one, you start getting up to something that would be like the size of a, a whale or so. So I'll go ahead and spawn in one of those. We have a few of the uh, first few giant creatures here. While we wait for those to uh, cook a little bit, um, can show a, a maybe more of a combination of settings. Say if I wanted something, um, something with some tentacles, maybe even with a lot of tentacles, uh, we could spawn a creature like that. Maybe we could make this one a predator. Um, I have to reset those. And uh, maybe I'll also put on radial symmetry. So most of the creatures in the game, um, if you don't set either, it's a, a random combination of, of either, it's most likely to be bilateral symmetry with a small chance of it being radial and an even smaller chance of there being no symmetry on startup. But like we can see there, those are, those are bilateral creatures. So I'll turn on radial symmetry for these tentacled creatures um, and see what, what comes up if we can get something a little bit octopus-like maybe. So this tiny creature seems to have an interesting combination of fins and tentacles. Here we see a few of the tentacled creatures swimming around. They're still pretty early, so it's not uh, it's not for sure which yet will will actually manage to find a niche. One of the uh, leviathans that we made. Makes the giant kelp look kind of small, even. Uh, one thing I thought was a little bit interesting was I actually found, uh, without realizing it, even though I'd ignored it, there was a species of very small foragers that actually adapted to living in the caves that were way underneath uh, everything else that was going on. They seem to be uh, the only species down here, so they've actually been living uh, totally unperturbed by any predation that might have otherwise been occurring up above. They're almost a little bit hard to see because of just how small they are. They seem to have long tails, the tiny green face. This last demonstration is a kind of science experiment. So one of the core ideas of ecosystem is that 
function drives form. That, through evolution, the physics of swimming is what drives how the creatures look and behave. And one of the things that the evolutionary toolbox allows you to do is to adjust the sort of higher level physical properties of the environment um, as a way to see how that affects the, the way that the creatures uh, adapt in your world. And, there, and so what I thought I would do for, the, um, for this final demonstration was essentially to go through some of those parameters, uh, vary them from like the, the maximum value they can be to the minimum one, uh, spawn different creatures at the different uh, parameter levels, and see uh, just what kind of effects the different physical properties of the environments have on what kind of creatures evolve in the world. So the first one is drag. Drag is very fundamental to uh, the physics of swimming in this game. So drag is just the, uh, when you move a limb through the water, drag is how much the water essentially pushes back. Um, and that's core to swimming in ecosystem because sort of balancing out drag forces in different ways is a big part of how creatures swim. In this case, the minimum value of drag is 0.1. Um, we can't actually make the drag zero because at that point you would be in a vacuum and of course you can't swim in a vacuum. So I've spawned two species here um, that will have 0.1 drag, the minimum possible value. And then what I will also do is just pull back a little bit and spawn in two more species with the maximum value of drag, which is 0.9. Uh, just like we can't go to zero on drag, we also can't go all the way up to one. That would essentially be that when you push through the water, the water pushes back just as strongly as you did, which would mean that you couldn't actually move. And so uh, what I'd like to see with this is just um, uh, what kind of changes we'll see in the creatures. How, how will the different drag levels affect what kind of body shapes, sizes, and swimming styles they come up with? We're about 50 generations in now, so not necessarily a ton, but enough to start seeing some changes. This is the first of the very low drag creatures. They have a rather simple body, uh, three parts, and they seem to use one for stability and one for thrust. Uh, the interesting thing about drag is that it's kind of a double-edged sword. It both stops creatures in the sense that as you're going forward, it's always pushing back against you. And yet at the same time, it's the major source of your thrust. So drag is not in and of itself a benefit or a detriment to creatures. Uh, it's it's both both the way forward and the way backwards in a sense. It's a, it's a positive and a negative. This is the second of our low drag species, looking quite a bit different than the others. It has a single tail fin. It almost reminds me of a bird a little bit. It has a very smooth sort of flapping of, of all of its limbs uh, and, and pretty well coordinated. Kind of a stubby body, which could possibly be because the drag force is not as important for them. But with just this small number of samples, it's hard to make a, a claim for sure that way, uh, one way or the other. This is the first of our high drag creatures. It has a really different body type than the low drag ones that we saw just a moment ago. Uh, in particular, it seems like it's evolved a lot of very small appendages that it just moves back and forth a little bit at a time. Here's the second of our high drag creatures. This one actually making quite a wide uh, flapping motion with its two limbs. One thing that I think is a little bit interesting about this is that when we sort this chart by speed, um, we see that there actually isn't a clear winner with regard to the drag forces. So uh, there, the Tarmado seemed to be uh, bringing up the top. They were one of the uh, low drag species. However, right behind them, um, often even quite close, are the Tilgar. Uh, who were one of the high drag species. And the two that sort of round out the bottom are the orange and yellow species, the Eulatelli and the Balagrun, who were, uh, who were both high drag and low drag. Um, and this kind of reflects the fact that drag is a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, so on the one hand, drag pushes you backward when, you, when you're swimming forward. Drag is a constant force that's slowing you down. And yet, at the same time, drag is also uh, the main source of thrust that you have. 
Um, if you're kicking a tail fin, it's drag that's propelling you forward, uh, and a few other things, but an ecosystem for mostly drag that's propelling you forward. And so uh, it actually makes sense that, in a sense, we would end up with a tie between creatures that have a low drag and a high drag. One thing I wanted to mention before I do any more tests is that for all of these creatures, I'll, I have been and will be setting the maturation time to infinite. What this does is essentially keep creatures in a permanently immature state. Um, and as far as the game is concerned, what that means is they spend um, all of their time learning how to swim. Uh, so they, they never actually graduate to a fully mature form where they have to then turn around and hunt for food and look for things and mate with other creatures and have a bunch of other things to worry about. Uh, because what we're concerned with right now is just swimming, um, I've set the maturation time to infinite so that that's the only thing that happens. So the second parameter I'd like to check out is aerodynamics. And aerodynamics uh, is meant to, in, the, in this case, is just meant to, to uh, kind of simulate the aerodynamics of each individual body part. So um, it, it's a kind of difference in the amount of thrust on the forward-facing parts uh, as opposed to the backwards-facing parts. The creatures that I spawned in just now have their aerodynamics set to the minimum value, uh, which is uh, which is one, and what that kind of means is that there is essentially no aerodynamics. So the front-facing body parts have just as much drag on them as the back-facing body parts. What that essentially means is that they'll have to work a lot harder in order to swim. And uh, what I've often seen in the past with creatures like this is that they have to, uh, th they will tend to be a lot slower. And also the swimming styles that they invent, they have to invent are a lot more complicated because the balancing act that they have to do is a lot greater with regard to the forward facing drag pushing them back versus the back facing drag giving them thrust to go forward. So they often evolve more complex swimming styles. And then I'll also pull back a little bit and I'll turn the aerodynamics all the way up. And uh, higher dynamics creatures are kind of the opposite. So they actually often don't have to work very hard to swim. So these creatures tend to be very fast um, and oftentimes they can get away with very small, slight movements to propel themselves forward. This is still pretty early in the evolution. I just wanted to show this because it's sort of interesting um, how complex the swimming style this creature has. Uh, this is one of the low aerodynamics creature and you can notice just how difficult it is for them to really generate a net thrust forward as compared to the lackadaisical high aerodynamics creatures who just sort of calmly propel themselves forward. So after a brief time skip we can check in on our creatures here. This is the first of our low aerodynamics creature. This creature kind of has two large fins on the back and it does a very smooth paddle to make its way forward. So it did figure out a way to swim even within the constraints of a low aerodynamics uh, world. Another high aerodynamics creature. This one, interestingly enough, developed four small limbs all on its back that it seems to use to propel itself a little bit. So in this case, it seems like our hypothesis largely was borne out. Um, our, all of our fastest creatures are from the higher dynamics, as you'd expect, and all of the slowest creatures uh, riding out the bottom are low aerodynamics. I mean, not all. There's, there's still a mix, but, uh, but there's a clear clustering, I think, here. One last demonstration I'd like to try out is muscle density. The way that muscle density works is that when a creature wants to move to contract a joint, um, it does so with a certain amount of torque. And the amount of torque it can apply, essentially the amount of, uh, of strength or of energy it can put into moving its limbs, depends on the surface area of the adjacent limb. Um, the surface area of the adjacent limb and also the muscle density. So by changing the muscle density, creatures will have to be larger um, in order to generate the same amount of force when they want to swing a limb. So these uh, back here that I'm spawning now have a much higher muscle density. 
so they actually won't need to be as big. Uh, they can get away with being smaller and still do the same force, or they could be the same size and be even stronger than they would normally be. After a brief time skip, uh, again about an hour, uh, we see that this first species with low muscle density has a very long body and comparatively small fins, which helps to, uh, helps to allow it to still do fairly powerful uh, thrusts with the fins. This species is similar. It actually has a lot of uh, small limbs that it moves. I mean, it has some bigger limbs here um, along the back, but it doesn't really tend to try to uh, paddle with them too much. The ones that it uses to actually generate thrust are kind of small. By comparison, this high muscle density creature has huge limbs compared to its body size. And the same is true of this creature as well. So in this scenario, we also tended to see that the, uh, as you'd expect, the higher muscle density creatures are faster. So this species, the Sadgore, and the Mojidori, um, the higher muscle density creatures, do seem to have a, a overall higher position on the uh, speed score ranking. Um, but it is notable that there are some of the, the even minimal muscle density creatures did uh, manage to get into the top 10. The Catapano species uh, were the first one I showed you with the long bodies and the tiny sort of tentacles. Um, but there's definitely a trend there of the high muscle density creatures being faster, which is of course what you'd expect. So uh, this is just a sample, um, just doing a couple species of each type isn't enough to give a really solid idea of what the trend is for any given change. Um, but hopefully it's enough to give you a sense of how you could change the environment and how evolution might react to that by changing the creatures that live there. Okay, so there you have it. That's a look at Ecosystem's journey so far and what the latest update brings to the table. The game is available now on Steam and Epic Games with a free demo available over on Steam too. Uh, links to all of that will be down in the description below. But in the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.